Howdy folks, welcome to Camera Shake, where we bring you the insider scoop on all things photography and videography, giving you a unique opportunity to stay ahead of the curve. We spent literally hundreds of hours interviewing some of the most renowned photographers of our time, giving you access to knowledge and expertise that's not available anywhere else. As always, I'm your host Kirsten Lutz, and in today's episode, we're going to be talking about one of the most creative forms of photography, toy photography. And if you're thinking, what? toy photography, let me tell you, this will blow your mind. So buckle up, grab a cold one, and let's shake it up with today's guest right after this. Welcome to Camera Shake Podcast, episode 151. But wait a second, before we get into today's episode, I have one small favor to ask of you. If you enjoy this podcast, please join the Camera Shake community over on camerashakepodcast.com so that you're the first ones to know when we've got some exciting news for you. You'll find the link in the description, or if you're watching on YouTube, it'll be right down here somewhere on the screen, unless I forget to put it in, of course. But without further ado, let's give up for today's special guest, the toy photographer, educator, and Kelby One instructor, Photoshop World Guru Award winner, and best of all, he's Canadian. Give it up for Dave the Bear Maker. Dave, man, how are you today? I'm doing very well. How about yourself? I'm good. I'm good. It's the, the I tell you what, the internet gremlins are at work today. It's been uh, it's been a crazy day. Uh, Virgin Media had a massive outage all across the UK, and uh, currently the internet's down. We're on five G. We're just going to hope for the best and see what happens. Hopefully, technology is always a uh, fun friend. <laughs> <laughs> not today. <laughs> no, it's not my friend today. <laughs> no. But uh, but you work in computers, so you must be used to this I, sort of thing. Yeah. Um, my day job is a site reliability engineer for Google. Um, so I don't deal with all the public facing stuff, but I have my job is to try to make sure that stuff like what you're experiencing now doesn't happen. And we're mostly successful. So, right. Yeah. I feel Virgin Media are probably going to have some job openings. And. <laughs> They very well. They very well might. It's. I mean, it's a tricky thing to be that reliable. Um, it takes a lot of thought and care. But somewhere, somewhere is, somewhere right now, somewhere in the Virgin is learning a lot of lessons about what not to do. Um, and that's the bright side for you know when this type of thing happens. Oh, I bet. And and I say that for our uh, viewers on YouTube. You know, if the video is a little bit choppy, that's that's just that's why. It's because we're currently connected via five G. Um, and uh, I'm tethering through that. And so hopefully things are going to hold up and we're just going to give it a shot and see what happens. But, uh, but Dave, of course, I want to talk to you about your incredible toy photography. And it's like, it's one of these things, right? When you first hear somebody mention the term toy photography, you kind of think, oh, well, it's probably like, you know, like, I don't know, Toys R Us, <laughs> you know, type right. of catalog photography. But... But your photography is is breathtaking. It literally uh, blew my mind when I first saw it because it it looks like 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 shots from a Hollywood movie. I mean, it just it's just incredible. Well, thanks. Uh, that's what I go for. Um, there's a lot of photographer toy photographers out in the world, and some try to be realistic to the toy, um, and some don't. And I try to just use the the figures as a model and. I do a lot of Photoshop work to kind of clean them up and get rid of the joints and all that type of stuff and try to make it look as real as possible. Because really what I want to do is be like a Hollywood filmmaker, but I don't have the budget and I don't live anywhere near Hollywood. So this is my uh, down and dirty way of trying to scratch that itch of creativity um, without having to uproot my life and move across the country. But that's exactly, I mean, that's, that's the thing. It's you're creating such spectacular imagery um really with you know with i mean it's uh, the detail is just it's just breathtaking and you know of course for those uh for those of you who are, who are watching this on youtube we'll fly in some images so you get, get an idea of what we're talking about but um the detail is just it's just incredible and I, you know we had a little uh, email conversation you know uh, a few weeks ago and um and it's you know it's not only of course you know you're photographing the the toys or the action figures, let's say, but then you're also building the sets. Like you're literally building the sets, but then 
you're even you're 3D printing the actual figures. It's just the amount of effort and, and attention to detail that goes into your work is just absolutely incredible. Well, yeah, the uh, I mean, it started off I was just taking figures. I started with Lego minifigures, the small little things, um, and I was just throwing them on my uh, my desktop um, or my desk and just shooting them. And I didn't really worry about the background or anything like that. But over time. Um, I've tried to add more of myself into my work and not just have, I used to just kind of go, this is the toy, it's what it is, I'm going to use it. But I've been trying to expand uh, what I put into it. And over time, it's gone from just using the toys to going online and buying unique uh, accessories to go with it to make my scenes to, um, that's really expensive. Um, if you ever want to spend a whole lot of money, look at the accessory market for uh uh, toys because you will drop a whole lot of money on uh, things really, really quickly. So I started using um, actually my we have work or have a makerspace. So I started learning how to do some stuff there, making some props. Um, like the first thing I made was a, a laser printed uh, sewer grate that I used for a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle. So the turtle was poking his head out of the sewer grate. Um, so that was the first thing I made that was really a prop. Um, and then from there, it kind of snowballed. Um, Really kind of after the uh, the COVID lockdown um, is when I really kind of got into making my own stuff because I had time um, and I just started making things and learning how to do it and realized it's not that difficult in the grand scheme of things. Uh, I started out thinking, I don't have the skill for this because I don't, like I can't draw with beans um, and I can't cut a straight line on a piece of lumber to save my life. So I was living in the under the impression that I can't do the physical things. I'll stick to the pre-made stuff and then fix it in Photoshop because I'm good at Photoshop. Uh, but I, I realized that it's not that difficult to get your work to like 80% looking good in real life. And that's enough for the camera. The, the, the camera actually provides a lot of grace when it comes to those types of things. So I realized that it was good enough to kind of make it look decent. And then in, once I figured that out, I just kind of snowballed and now I kind of make everything from scratch. So At least you, some stuff from scratch. So did you have to learn all those skills, like the model building skills and, and the, like, uh, the, I mean, you've just, you know, I say you, you 3D, 3, sorry, I said you 3D print your models, but then you also hand paint them and they look incredible. Yeah. yeah um, some of that's thanks to uh, Photoshop and thanks to um, the camera. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, all of that stuff I had to learn and really I've only been painting the minis for maybe the last year or so. Um, just cause I wanted to, I just kind of got to the point where I wanted to create those figures that I couldn't buy on the, on the shelf. Um, so yeah, I started painting and, and if, when you look at, and I, I did it mainly by watching YouTube tutorials. Um, YouTube is a gold mine for this stuff. Um, uh, pretty much anything diorama related, there's a YouTube thing somewhere that I used to learn it, uh, but it's actually not that difficult. Um, and I, I don't say that as in like, you know, well, oh, Dave knows what he's doing, but it's really not that difficult. Um, I think what the, what kind of takes it from meh to okay, or impressive looking, I guess you will, um, is that, um, you have to kind of layer on details. So, uh, you, you print off the figure then it's just a great thing. You put on the base coat of, okay, his pants are going to be blue and his shirt's going to be red and his face is whatever skin color is the character is. But then you have to take it another step and then paint in some other details to bring out uh, some of the uh, the details and, and, and uh, accentuate the, the shadow areas by using like a technique called washes, which is like a really light coat of paint that just kind of settles into the dark areas and kind of adds a tone. Then you do dry brushing, which is basically taking a brush that almost has no paint on it and just lightly brushing it over the figure and that gets the paint on the highlight. So if you use white on that, then it kind of brings out the details like in the cloth and stuff, uh, which kind of makes the fear pop and it doesn't look so much painted as it does more realistic. And then when you add the camera lights into it, it kind of brings out all those details. But it's, it's, I mean, there's so many um, so many details to take care of because I, I remember watching one of your videos where you explain about um not painting highlights onto the figures because because obviously you're lighting uh right you know you're lighting your figures 
And so that, you know, that's a major difference between painting them to go on a shelf, for example, as opposed to actually appearing in a photograph. And, you know, it's, it's just uh, really, it's completely boggled my mind as to how, you know, how detailed you are at creating these effects. It's like things I would have never thought about. Yeah, it's um, honestly learning how to paint. It was co a combination of uh, painters like uh, Warhammer or D&D, &D, a lot of those tutorials for how to paint minis. But where I got the don't put in the highlights, because a lot of those painters will actually paint in um, kind of light onto their figures because it makes them look better when they're sitting on a gaming table. But I was watching uh, Adam Savage, uh, the Mythbusters guy. Uh, he's also done a lot of Hollywood work. And his on his channel called Tested, he talks a lot about um, how to make his models camera ready for like how you would paint it for Hollywood as opposed to as anything else. So that's kind of where I got the idea of what you can get away with and what you need to do to make it look better on the for the camera, because you really do have to paint it different for the camera than you do for um, real life, because the camera sees differently than the eye does. Yeah, you know, um, that reminds me, uh, some years ago, I went to the Science Museum in London, um, and uh, I saw a Lord of the Rings exhibition, where basically they, uh, right, right. they you know, they were exhibiting uh, costumes and props and models and sometimes scale models of the stuff that they've been using in the original Lord of the Rings uh, trilogy. And it was it was super interesting. I mean, it was just incredible. First of all, it was uh, incredible to see the miniatures, you know, and right. how detailed they were. Um, and then they had um, Sean Bean's character. I remember at the at the very end of the Fellowship, the first Lord of the Rings movie, um, Sean Bean's character dies and get sent yep. off in a canoe. Remember, they, they sent him off on the river. Yep. Um, and that was actually a model. It's a wax figure in a canoe. And oh, really? Okay. Yeah, and it was incredible. It, it, it was just the detail. I mean, you could see every hair of his beard. Like, you had to get really, really close to realize that that's not a real human in this. That's, like, that's a, a you know, a Madame Tussauds-style wax figure in this, in this, in this bolt, <laughs> you know, essentially. Um, and then, of course, it yeah. was super interesting to see the um, the uh, the costumes, for instance, the, how detailed the cloth was, and how how detailed uh, some of the leather work was, and stuff like that. But then, what was really fascinating was to see how totally not detailed all the background uh, actors' costumes were, because they were so far away from the camera, there was no need to put all the detail in you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, the. Uh... That, I noticed that they also tend to add details that you don't even see on camera. Yeah. Uh, because it helps the actor get more involved in the role, and then you get a better performance that way. But some of the details, like Weta is just amazing at what they do. Um, and if I if I could roll back time and, you know, do something else with my career, um, working at Weta would be one of those dream jobs because they're just top of their game. They just make some incredible things. It's, you know, it was incredible uh, to see how they made the chainmail for all the costumes. You know, they had they had two people literally working for years, just chopping up little plastic tubes and then hand making all of the chainmail for all the costumes, and it took them years. And it was just, yeah. it, it was nuts. You can three D print that now. Um, there's a way you can three D print uh, chainmail that it's already linked together. Oh, um, wow. And um, when you take it off, it kind of flattens out, and then you get like a bigger piece of chain mail that would fit in the printer bread. I never tried it yet, but it looks very handy for cosplayers. I mean, that's, that's an interesting thing because you're, uh, like I mentioned earlier, you're, you actually now you're, you're 3D printing your models. Um, right. Take me a little bit, uh, take me through that process because that's, I find that super interesting. Um, I've never actually, I don't think I've ever 3D printed anything. So, how does that even work? Um, well, um, the first thing you have to do is uh, figure out what models you want to print. Um, and there's a wide variety of places to get models from. You can also make your own. There's You can get free software to make your own. That's a whole skill set in of itself to create a 3D object of a character, especially ones that have human faces because you have the uncanny valley, so you have to really be good at faces, uh, which is why a lot of my, my work doesn't use human faces because I'm not good at painting them yet. Um, but uh, So you download a model from somewhere, um, and then you go through this... Uh, process of what's called slicing. So you take this model, which is like a generic 3D file that describes the figure. 
Um, then you, the slicing is kind of like a like little like a printer driver when you print something on a piece of paper where it translates your document into printer language. Um, it does this exact same thing uh, for uh, it translates that generic uh, 3D object into the language that your particular printer needs. Um, and there are so a couple types of 3D printers that you can use uh, that are generally available. One's a filament printer, which is uh, uh, it takes a filament of plastic and melts it, and then it moves the head around and then deposits the plastic where it needs to go, and then just keeps on going until you have an object, um, which it works great for bigger things, but it's not so great for the fine details. So I use a uh, type of printer called a resin printer. Um, my The exact model I use is an Elegoo Saturn um, 8K, if anyone's interested. Um, but it's a resin printer, and the way that works is... You have, it actually prints upside down. So if you pr picture at the top is like a build plate and then the bottom is like a vat where you put liquid resin in. So just a big pile of goo. Um, and then below that is a UV screen um, and the resin is UV activated. So what happens is, is the build plate comes down into the uh, resin vat. So the pile of goo and gets like half a millimeter or less away from the screen. And then what the screen does is it exposes what that layer looks like in UV light. And then that cures the resin for just a little bit. So it makes the shape of the object. Um, and it usually takes about two and a half, three seconds per layer. Then the build plate moves up a bit, comes back down to the, just to the level of the next level. And then it exposes for that level. And this keeps on working its way up until the object is finished. Um, and when, when that's done, um, you have to go through this cleaning process. Uh, so you take out the build plate from the printer and you kind of scrape it off because the build plate is just like, I think it's like aluminum, flat aluminum chunk. Um, so you have to scrape it off uh, with like a paint scraper just to get it off the build plate. And then you dip it in an al alcohol bath to kind of get rid of all the excess resin that be sticking around. And then you stick it in another UV light just to finish curing it. So it goes from like half baked to fully baked so everything gets nice and hard. And then after that, it's just a 3D chunk of plastic that you can start painting or whatever you want to do with it. It's so actually, how, it's, it's kind of gooey, but it's not really all that difficult. How long, um, how long does that process take? Like how, how long does it take to, let's say, print a figure? Um, let's see here. For like an average, like four inch figure, it probably takes six or seven hours. Oh, wow. Um, okay. Something like that. The... I think I can print up to a foot high of thing, and I think that's about 14 hours. If my, my numbers are roughly, but the longest print I've ever done is 14 hours, so whatever the build capacity of the uh, the printer is, I think it's roughly a foot, is about 14 hours. So start at the, if you start at first thing in the morning, um, it'll be ready probably by bedtime. Or usually I start it after work, and then it's ready for the next day. And so I, I know some of the uh, models that you've printed are basically made up of, of a number of different parts. So you're going to have to, presumably, you're going to have to print each part individually. And so it'll, it could take, I guess, days possibly to, to even print the whole thing. It can. Um, with uh, And one of the nice things about resin printers is that the time delay is per layer, not how much material you're using. So if you, if you, so you can print off like several parts of a figure as long as it all fits into that on that build plate and then it'll all print off at the same time um, so some figures will have multiple parts but they all kind of fit into the same build plate so it doesn't take any longer than the longest or i guess the tallest part to print but if they're bigger and you have to um, do it multiple times then it can take days like i i printed off a, a dragon a few uh a few uh months ago um and that took like two solid weeks of printing um because there was it was, it's like a 26 inch wide dragon. It's massive. Um, and I, each only one part could fit on a build plate at a time for most of it. And each print was like eight to 12 hours. So, uh, it took like a good two weeks. There's 26 parts or something like that. Um, so it can take a while to, uh, to do, but if you're talking about those little figures, um, that most of my stuff I print is usually it can be printed off in one or two passes. Wow. That's, I call that dedication, man. <laughs> I mean, not doing anything during most of that time. It's like yeah. actually the time it takes for me to like, once I know what model I want to set up a print, 
can take as little as 10 minutes. And then the cleanup, it probably takes about 10 minutes. Then assembling is... So you, for, so to get the an average figure from on the internet to physically in your hand of actual work that I do and time put into it could be as little as half an hour to like an hour before I'm actually starting painting. So it's not that... I mean, it's shorter time than it would take to like get in my car and drive to a store to buy it. So as far as you just have to be patient in the middle. So where, where do you get the actual designs for, for the models from? Or, or... Do you make them yourself, or how does that work? I don't make it myself. Um, uh, I don't have the I don't have the patience for that. Um, but there are many sites that um, provide models. Some are free. Some are subscription. Uh, like some free ones are like Thingiverse and Printables dot com. Uh, but I subscribe to a site called Loot Studios, um, and they have it's like a subscription type thing where they, every month they put out a series of figures based around a theme. Um, so I'll, every month I, they get a choice of like, well, I get all the figures, but there'll be like 30 new tech figures and accessories and props and stuff. And usually I just kind of absorb those in until I see a figure that says, Hey, that one looks interesting. And then I'll print that off and uh, do my thing with it. So how did you first get into photographical toys what was the what was the what was the origin of that um extreme laziness um yeah and uh the way i like to describe it is i didn't one day i didn't want to put on trousers um so <laughs> the reason why i say that is is i started doing toy photography when my kids were really young um and i was do, participating in this uh photography scavenger hunt type thing where uh, it was actually on Google Plus, if you remember Google Plus. Um, and it's basically the way it worked was you're given 10 words and then you're given like a month to shoot those 10 words and then you submitted the stuff and right. people judged it. it was all for fun. But that was basically it. And I had one word, which was candy cane because it was Christmas themed at the time because it was December. Um, and I was sitting at home because my wife was out shopping and I was daddy on call. So I was, the kids were asleep, but I was downstairs trying to figure out what to do. And I just started looking for things and I went through my old Lego that I was keeping for my uh for my son and I saw a uh a Star Wars uh, Stormtrooper minifig um and an axe and that brought to mind what if I took candy canes and had these stormtroopers chopping them up like uh chopping up firewood um so I thought of that I called my wife and said hey while you're out can you please pick up some candy canes and she did uh and then uh we came home and I set up the scene of two uh, Stormtrooper minifigs chopping up firewood. And uh, that was kind of my first uh, photo. Then when I submitted it, um, I got a lot of positive feedback. Um, people were impressed. They thought it was creative, um, especially people that I admired um, saying, this is really cool. So that kind of encouraged me to um, do it again uh, for the hunt and for subsequent rounds. So I kept on doing that. Um, and eventually it just kind of became my thing and then i i eventually went from minifigs to action figures and then kind of where i am now but that's been like a 10-year process i think so far how's your how has your process changed um since you know since you first started to now where of course it seems like it's gotten a lot more elaborate since the beginning yes. um I'm not entirely sure if it's actually changed all that much in terms of kind of the steps I go through. Um, each each shoot usually starts off with me thinking of an idea um, somewhere along the line. I just think of an idea. Uh, it used to be based on the hunt words that I was given, but now it's just walking around and I, an idea pops in my head and hey, I can do something with this. Or if I get my uh, uh, Loot Studios monthly thing and I see a figure and said, hey, that's cool. Maybe I could do something with that. And then I just, and I, I start visualizing in my head kind of what the scene will generally look like and kind of what I want the, the thing to look like and, and start planning out how, I, how I'll need to do it. Like I'll need this angle. So I'll probably need this size of figure and this type of background and, you know, put the lights here. Can I do that? And kind of get a rough sketch in my head of what I want to do. And then I start building it. Um, at first, when I was first starting it, uh, first starting out, I would kind of have an idea, but the f idea was basically I kind of wanted to shoot this figure and vaguely doing this activity. Like, you know, and then I would sit down and 
go through my Lego box and see if I can build uh, backgrounds and stuff and just kind of throw stuff together um, and then shoot what it was. Uh, and over time, it's slowly become um, more and more. I kind of got bold enough to take the time to put whatever needed to be into the photo. I think that that may be what the uh, thing that has changed the most is at first I kind of just grabbed whatever it was, um, which may involve like ordering something off Amazon and waiting for a week for it to show up. But I would kind of do that and then shoot whatever I had. But over time, I gained the confidence um, in my own abilities to say, I don't have to work with what I have now. I can build the world that I want to shoot. Um, and over time, it's kind of built up the skills. So now, um, usually when I think of a thing to shoot, um, if I'm doing it in my studio, it involves what diorama are we going to build? And it's like a blank, complete blank slate, and then I can build everything up. Let me just say a quick thank you to our sponsor, DVE Store. DVE Store's mission is to help you create better video and provide you with the tools necessary to explore your creativity. If you have any digital video equipment needs, whether that's camera equipment, audio gear or lighting, and much more, you can check them out at dvestore.com. Thank you to DVE Store for the high def video. And of course, you can find a link to DVE Store in the description. One thing I've seen on your website that I absolutely love is, is the, uh, you've done the, You've done a series, um, which you call like something like historical photos of building the Millennium Falcon. Uh, yes, yes. Ah, this is incredible. I'll tell you what, I mean, I've been sitting on the couch watching, uh, looking at those images. And I was like laughing out nonstop. It's just uh, the way you've broken down the whole process is absolutely hilarious. And, uh, and I'm sure we'll, we'll, you know, if you're watching on YouTube, we'll be flying in some images from that as well. How did you come up with the idea and how long did it take you to, to put all of that together? Um, it took several weeks, uh, to do everything. I don't know the exact time, but it was multiple weeks. Um, with the way that that started was Lego announced that they were going to release this millennium Falcon, um, mm -hmm. model, which I was very excited about because at the time I was shooting Lego and that was my thing. And I had a smaller millennium Falcon Lego model, but it wasn't to scale. And you but know, this I new one, Every time my daughter and I walk past the Lego store, we look at that, at that, at that Millennium Falcon model. We're like, oh man, one day. Yes. <laughs> no, um, one day. Yeah. It's, it's, it's an amazing model, but it's to scale. Um, and that would excited me because then I could actually use my figures and do realistic size things. Um, but it's really expensive. It's like the, at the time it was the largest Lego model ever made. Um, and it was really expensive. Um, so. I bought it because, you know, I'm a geek and I have a day job. So I said, Hey, I want this. I'm going to buy it. So I did. Um, but and as I was kind of going through the process of starting to build it, um, and it took a while to even start because there's like, you know, how Lego comes in little packs of things like little bags. Yeah. There were in the big box, there were, I think like 16 smaller boxes full of multiple bags of those. It was it's like, I forget how many pieces, like 7,000 pieces or something like that. It's a massive thing. Um, for some reason, what came to my mind was images that I've seen of old shipyards in like Ireland, like building like the Titanic and those types of things. And I thought that might make an interesting background for shooting things with this model while I'm building it. So I actually stopped building the Millennium Falcon, went to grab some more Lego. Um, it's the only... Uh, time I built Lego and I had to buy another model to do it uh, because I went out and bought a crane model that I could use to like, you know, because you're craning stuff, parts in a place, we needed a crane. So I bought well, bought a crane. Then I went out and bought a bunch of construction figure guys and some more droids because in the Star Wars world, you have people building it, you have droids building it. So I bought a bunch of that stuff and some like scaffolding type Lego pieces. And then as, when, as I started building the the actual model, which took several weeks, I took, I posed photos every once in a while of the process and then built up the series. Um, yeah, it was kind of fun. And then at one point in time, actually, uh, one of the photos is a shot of a mock movie that was being made on the set of the Millennium Falcon, which cracked me up. Yeah. It's just, it's just the, the different levels there. It's, you know, it's, it's really, it's so entertaining. And of course, 
it's one of these, it's almost like an expansion to the Star Wars universe, you know, it's because we all know the Millennium Falcon, but actually thinking about, well, how was that damn thing built in the first place? It must have been built at some point, you know, yeah. in the universe. So it's, it was uh, just super fun looking at this whole, this, this photo series of, of it coming together. I like it. And at the same time, too. you know, and at the same time, I'm thinking like, what, well, you know, because I know how long these things take, you know, I'm thinking like, how the hell, <laughs> How you, like how do you how do you plan this out? Um, and then of course the other thing that was really fascinating to me was that everything's so well lit as well. Like you know, not only did you put the thought into you know creating the scene and like you know getting you know building the model up to a certain point and then building this whole scene around it, but then you also lit the whole thing really theatrically. You know, that was the other thing that uh, how did you? I mean, this is actually just generally. This is something I think that really comes across in the imagery. Um, it's like everything's so well lit and thought out. I mean, you know, you've got, you've got the obviously the models, the subjects themselves, but then you're you're building this scene with so much effort. Um, but then once all of that's done, you, you know, you're creating a texture um, because I know you you know you're building stuff out of foam. I guess is that what it is? Yeah, construction foam. Yeah. Yeah, and then and then you're like painting stuff, and then you're putting texture on there, and and then and then you're lighting the whole thing. Um, how do you go about creating the lighting for a scene like that? Um, well, with lighting, um, I use a loom cubes a lot, both their cubes and their panels, um, right. mainly because they're the right size for uh, for what I'm doing. Um, and they fit on, I use a Plotty Pod gear uh, to hold it up mostly. Um, and I have several panels and several cubes. And you know, a lot of times it's just a matter of usually lighting it from both sides. Um, you t well, typically, okay, but my main light setup is I have a big light that kind of sits over everything. I kind of think of it just like your room light that I, I just turn on and kind of shine it over everything. And that kind of just gives a bit of illumination to the whole scene. Uh, one of the issues with toy photography is that because of the scale and your lens is so close to the figures that you're dealing with really uh, low um, f-stops. Like f22 is a common place where I'm at. So light, you need a lot of light to overcome that. Um, so I, I usually have the scene illuminated generally just to provide a base amount of light uh, so the camera will actually take a photo of something. And then I have loom cubes coming in from either side to get the edge lights and then um, maybe one in the front if I need to get a front light. Uh, but I use the cubes themselves. Uh, the loom cubes come with a uh, barn doors and a snoot attachment. Um, and I'll shine those on various places if I need to um, accentuate an area or if I'm going to add in some special effects. Uh, for example, if uh, I have a figure holding like a lightsaber and the lightsaber glows, um, I'll shine a bit of extra light onto the figure from the direction of where the lightsaber would be. So when I light it up in Photoshop, the light's kind of already there. Um, so that's kind of the basics. And uh, the problem with the light, so even the loom cubes are really small, is that compared to the figures, they're still massive. Like a small little loom cube is, for a six inch action figure, is about the same size as like a two foot softbox. So that's the smallest you can get. Um, and light spills everywhere, and some you only have sometimes millimeters between the thing you want lit and the background where you don't want lit. So it's hard to get the light going in the exact right places that you want. So often what I'll do is I will light with several passes uh, to get the lights where I want. So I'll have the figure um, set up and posed and everything, and the camera set up. And then I'll just take one light and just kind of shine it in one angle. Uh, so maybe I'll be shining one angle to get his left side and, you know, maybe if he's holding something to kind of light that and not worry about the light spill everywhere else. And then I'll move it over to the right side to make sure I get the right, the right things I want light on that side. Just kind of move the light around and take many, many shots. Uh, I think on average is probably about six to eight shots to light a scene that way. Um, sometimes more, sometimes less, depending on the complexity, but roughly that. Um, and then in Photoshop, um, you just add those, all those layers in Photoshop, set uh, all but the bottom one to uh, the light, light and blend mode, and then use mask just to mask in the parts that, of the lights that you actually want. And that way you can build up the light 
Uh, as I said, I just grab it, put all the lights in all the right places of uh, that. So you don't have to worry about the spill because it's, it's incredibly hard to light a figure and the background when it's so close together, uh, at least with the gear I have and do it all in one pass. Sometimes I can, and I try to if I can, but if I can't, then using the multiple uh, light exposure light technique um, works so really you're well for that. So you're effectively light painting the scene. And you know, the, that's great because kind of, yeah. that's exactly the same technique that I use um, to shoot cars. Um, so during, you know, during the pandemic, yeah. um, I uh, went out and because, well, I'm, I'm a portrait photographer, so I, sh- I shoot people or photograph people. Um, but during the pandemic, as you can imagine, like during lockdowns and whatnot, you know, all of that was frowned upon <laughs> or just yeah. outright illegal, of course. Yeah. Uh, but uh, so I went in a, and I, I started photographing cars and I used this uh, this light painting technique, which is exactly what you just described, where, you know, you go around and you basically light different parts of the car and you take individual shots of different, you know, uh, and, and and then in photo, in Photoshop, you composite it all together. Um, so that you then control the light on different aspects of the car. And you can really, you can create composites that look amazing because the whole car is evenly lit or, you know, you get light into places that you wouldn't ordinarily get light into because if you were lighting it with one or two light sources. Um, and you can get these, you create these uh, these images that are actually a little sort of hyper real almost, but extremely yeah. punchy. Yeah, it's interesting you say that because... The, I, the person I got the idea from to do this was Tim Wallace, who's a famous car photographer. Um, like, he's amazing. Um, and he was teaching a class at Photoshop World. And I'm not interested in cars. Like, cars are just not my thing. But I had a, I had a session free. Like, I did, like, none of the classes were, like, really hitting. Like, I must go to this. So I thought, well, um, the guy's British. And I like a British accent. So what's the harm? I'll go check out his thing. I got an hour to kill. So I sat in there. And what he was talking about mainly was shooting cars is kind of tricky because it's a big, shiny, curved surface. And what clued in my head was action figures, especially like Lego minifigures, they're really just small, curved, shiny surfaces. So a lot of these techniques apply just to a very much smaller scale. Um, And that's kind of where I started playing more with my own lights on the figures and using those same ideas and it's worked out pretty well so far. And of course it gives you an opportunity to really control the light. I mean literally you can control the light up to, you know, and you don't have to necessarily have you know, five, six, seven different light sources and and, and slack them off and you know, yep. um, and one, you know, one light source will have an impact on another light source and so it's it becomes yep. very complicated. Uh, in you know trying to recreate that in real life, and I actually think uh, that with this sort of light painting technique, uh, you can be a lot more precise with the yeah. way that you light stuff. And the other thing is, you have a lot of creative license when you use that technique because it's your creative eye that will basically decide, you know, all right, I'm gonna I'm gonna do this, and I'm gonna add some more light here, or you know, I'm gonna do whatever I think the best outcome is gonna be for me creatively, and that's. That's such an advantage. Yeah, and I'm, I'm a big fan of not being limited by your tools. Um, and it, that helps overcome that a great deal. The other thing is, when you're doing the light painting, is you don't have to add in the light at full strength. Yes. Um, so you can layer in something and just add it just a little bit. And sometimes all you need to do is, you know, this part is just a little too dark. I want it dark, but there's no detail there. But if you had to take a more well lit shot and then fade it in so you just just start to see the detail and that's a lot to the image without affecting the whole light balance of everything exactly and, and, you know with cars i found it extremely useful um like especially you know as you say a car is a curved surface and you have to deal with reflections all the time um so it gives you it gives you um the opportunity not only to to deal with that but also at the same time um like I said, you can get light into places where you'd ordinarily would find a lot of shadow, like wheel arches, for example, is a really good example. Right. You know, and and so you can get some, you can get a lot of detail out of things that would ordinarily really just uh, sort of you know fade away in the darkness, you know, in, in the shadows. Um, like at the top of the tire, you know, uh, you get some you can get some detail in that where ordinarily you wouldn't necessarily see that. And of course, again, you know what it does is it gives you sort of a hyper real 
visualization of of that of that right. car, but it's it just doesn't hide any detail. You have, you have the opportunity to bring all that detail. What, one really good example is actually um, you know lighting the interior as well as the exterior, so you can get you can create these shots where you've got this beautiful exterior, but then you can also get a lot of detail of the interior, which you know <laughs> which ordinarily would be. Um, would be hidden by the windscreen because you get a lot of reflections on that, you know, right. and yeah, stuff like that. Exactly. And you, yeah, and you can you can then uh, you can light the interior in a particular way as well by hiding lights inside and you know and stuff like that. So I found that um, it's such a it was such an interesting process, and I, I think the way I I I learned about that was uh, in fact when when we first started the the podcast at the very beginning of the pandemic. So this podcast, as all of our listeners will know, when I was up in <laughs> ranting on about this for, for <laughs> forever. Um, so this podcast is is a direct um, result of the pandemic. Okay. Because at the beginning of the pandemic, when the first major lockdown happened, my friend Nick Kirby and I, you know, uh, sat around and literally thought, wow, like all of our work's gone. You know, everything stopped. And, um, and, uh, and watching Netflix wasn't really all that after a few weeks. And we kind of, you know, we thought like, well, we got to do something creative. Um, what can we do? And we came up with the idea of doing a podcast um, since we were talking about right. photography related stuff all the time anyhow it made sense um, and, and very early on we had a guest on the show uh, and I linked to this episode right here if you're watching on YouTube um, and he was talking to us it was uh, David Cox I remember and he's a British expat living in Hollywood um, doing um, uh, special effects and, and 3D stuff for, for Hollywood and and uh, and he was telling us about you know being locked locked down in, in lockdown and uh, how he would sneak out at night, literally dressed ninja style all in black, and he would just light paint these cars, these awesome you know uh, classic cars in his neighborhood, and so he'd, he'd literally like run out, set up a camera, grab like a stick light type of a thing you know, and right. then he would just uh, create these light paintings and then put them together. You know, in, in these in these amazing in these amazing images, and I thought, that's wow, cool. that's such a such a cool idea. Um, and I thought, yeah, that's that's really great because it gives you something to do. You know, it's really creative. Um, it really, you know, it allowed me to learn a new lighting technique, and and uh, I you know and I could do it without having to meet other people. <laughs> you know, you could just yeah sneak out and, and do it. And of course, nighttime was perfect for that because you know it just allowed you to light cars. But that's, that's super interesting. I never thought of that actually in in conjunction with toys. Such a good idea. Yeah, um, the pandemic has changed so much. I know when we saw the pandemic coming, like from work, um, we were like, "You're probably going to be sent home for a few weeks." Um, so I started preparing to work from home, um, and I didn't have a place to set up shop. So the place I had to set up shop was the desk I used to shoot my toys. So I thought, well, that's not going to work. So I went out. And instead of buying a new desk for my work, I went out and bought a crafting desk for my crafting and set, I set all that up. And then I just used my, I used the old desk for my work because, you know, whatever. Then I have, but I now have this nice setup where I can actually build these things. And that has saved so much time and frustration and been a boon to my creativity because of that. Cause I have these tools just sitting like they're right outside the door here. Um, that I can create at will basically, which is a nice thing to have. And I think, you know, I always think that that was one of the, one of the, one of the few positive aspects of the pandemic, of course, you know, having that time and, and sort of almost like being forced into being creative because, well, there was just nothing else to do. And it was just, right. you know, for, for me, it was just a matter of like actually keeping sane, you know, that was the, that was the yeah. main part like you know mental health wise it was like well i need to do something otherwise i'm going to go so crazy <laughs> you thought around yep. here um and i did I, mean, I did a very similar thing actually um what you see behind me uh so that's that's usually just where i do my editing but because i knew i was gonna work from home a lot more and um you know and i was going to be desk bound basically for most of it i needed to create an environment that i thought was was uh you know was just creative like you know what's the best way to put that you know i figured that because i would have to look at it all day long it just needed to be pleasing to my creative eye if you right. know what i mean, if you know what I mean. Uh, because otherwise you know i spent the first few weeks or maybe the first month 
um, really just just staring at a white wall. You know, sitting at a desk, looking at a white wall, and I thought, well, I can't be doing that. That's <laughs> driving me nuts. <laughs> you know, I go snow yeah, blind. If I look at this, and uh, you know, and I, I remember like we had, you know, we were originally uh, we were meant to travel to Canada. In fact, well, my wife's Canadian, and uh, and I have family in Canada, and we were supposed to go and see them in in uh, Alberta, and uh, and of course flights got cancelled and then you know we rebooked for the or we we banked our flights for the following august because we thought oh yeah it's all gonna be over by then oh, yeah yeah and yeah, then, yeah and then it was <laughs> and yeah. then you know and then that went out of the window <laughs> and you know and that was uh and we still haven't been back to canada so it's it's, it's just one of these things but um but yeah i that's the one thing i love about i mean there's many things i hate about the pandemic for sure but the one thing i do love is how you know it has really kind of Kickstarted a lot of creativity um, in you know in, especially in photography and and I think generally in the arts that was just you know is it one of these yeah just put a fire on, yeah. under it, it and it was just great. forced a lot of people out of the comfort zone and it gave them time to explore something else. Um, I know many creative people who have done different things uh, like Glenn Dewis. I'm not sure if you're familiar with Glenn Dewis. Oh no, Glenn, um, yes, of course. Yeah, he's a f- uh, portrait photographer in the UK. Um, and he did this awesome uh, World War II veterans project. Um, but during the pandemic, he started doing landscapes, and now he's really good at landscape photography. And he still does the other thing. But yeah. that type of thing, I think, really... Like, for myself, building the dioramas became more of a thing because I had the time to put into it. And it also... Because I work from home, and I still work from home now, after the pandemic, I took the option that my uh, employer gave me to keep working from home. But it allows me to do things like, um, well, building dioramas is a lot of like hurry up and wait, like glue a bunch of stuff together, got to wait for the glue to dry, put on the, you know, a primer, uh, paint primer, got to wait for that to dry, put on the next thing, got to wait for that to dry. So you can do that like first thing in the morning, put on a layer of paint, let it dry while you're working, then at lunch, do the next thing, then at supper, do the next thing. Um, and that kind of stuff that you couldn't do when you went to a nine to five day job and you weren't home for all that time, uh, that kind of just keeps it makes it possible to do more things in a shorter amount of time which kind of keeps the creativity flowing for me yeah exactly it works i tell you what it works in exactly the same way for me i work from home as well and um you know i do i do some staring at spreadsheets and writing emails and then you know when once i've had enough of that i can do something creative edit some photos you know or or, or write right, a right. video or or think about the next you know camera shake episode or something like that. I could do a little bit of, of creative work and then, you know, I sort of reset my brain and then I can go back into the slightly more boring stuff, you know. Although my day job does include a lot of photography as well. So it's, you know, it, it's, it's still interesting. <laughs> it's nice. But yeah. yeah. Um, now, you mentioned uh, the Loom Cube and um, and the uh, and some um, some Planet Pod um, stuff. So let's talk about that for a minute because um, there's one, one of the things I saw when I was uh, looking at your behind the scenes uh, footage and stuff, and I've 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 noticed you're uh, using quite a few uh, different platypods. So you've, I think I've seen you use the uh, the platypod extreme. Yep. Yeah, you, I have uh, all three of the platypods: uh, the Max, the which I don't think you get anymore, the Ultra, which is the small version, and the Extreme, which is their new larger one. Um, I, I use all their accessories: the goosenecks, the uh, elbows, the um, el- um, clamps. They're great for holding up action figures or like reflectors and stuff. Um, exactly, because yeah, because the one thing that's, that gets tricky is when you're when you're building your models, for example. Um, just imagine if you had like you know five different tripods uh, around that, it would just take up so right. much space. It would just get really clunky and, and complicated, overly complicated or unnecessarily complicated. So, um, so I've got just for those uh, for those uh, listeners and viewers, especially viewers, I guess, because I'm holding up a plastic bottle in a sec. Um, if you don't know what a platypod is, basically a platypod is um, essentially a plat like a tripod like platform that you can mount a whole bunch of things to. Um, so this is a really good example for the platypod extreme. So you can mount um, a tripod hat on it, or you can actually put a you can put a camera directly on it, and it, I guess yep. it allows you to get really super low. It does, which is handy for what I do because when you're shooting six inches off the ground, having your camera less than six inches off the ground is really helpful. Exactly. Um, and I'll tell you what I love about, um, especially the extreme is, uh, what they've done with, with those little, uh, with those little pin, like, whatever you call them, these little legs, the legs that you can, yeah. that you can switch That's... out. 
such a game changer. I, 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 I hated the legs on the old ones because they were all manual screw in and yeah. to take them all the way out. But just snapping them in place just makes it so much more usable. It's, it's exactly. a fantastic innovation for them. Oh, absolutely. It's so super easy. I mean, like, you can literally just pull them out, switch them around. And what it allows you to do is to, to first of all, give it some some more stability. Um, if you're out, for instance, in like uneven terrain, you can level it out quite well with that as well. So, um, and it's, there's so much flexibility. I use these platypus all the time. In fact, um, if you're wondering, I know you're probably not wondering, but if you are wondering, um, <laughs> you know, I basically, um, I mount my phone to a platypod and a gooseneck, which is this little extension um, neck, flexible neck thing. Um, and so I can I have a timer on there so I know when to switch my camera on and off. Um, and usually I can see myself on there. Um, but it's just great to just place things in different places, like light. you can attach lights to it or um, clamps for your phone or, or other bits and bobs, basically. Yeah. I, uh, the nice thing about the platypod, too, is that there's multiple places to attach uh, quarter 20 uh, adapters, which is the standard camera adapter stuff for all the accessories, especially the goosenecks and the loom cubes. So you can set up one platypod to the side of the diorama, put in a couple of goosenecks, sometimes uh, daisy chaining goosenecks to get more reach, and then it can have one platypod that holds up a couple lights and you can put them exactly where you want them. Oftentimes they have to use a brick or something to weigh it down, otherwise it gets top heavy because I'm dramatically uh, altering the uh, center of gravity. Uh, but that makes life a lot easier. Um, because I have a YouTube channel too, where I record some behind the scenes stuff, um, I also have GoPros set up when I'm doing stuff. So I use the uh, pl uh, Platypod gear, what I call the Platyverse, um, all their stuff. And she's to hold up by behind the scenes recording stuff as well as the light I'm actually using to shoot my my photos with. Yeah, I mean, it's so super flexible. Um, you know, like you mentioned earlier, there's, there's, there's so many different accessories. Um, these, I mean, these goosenecks are absolutely fantastic, you know, because you can, you can bend them to any shape you want. Um, you can attach multiple of those to a single platypod, for yep. example. Um, and, uh, and of course, you know, the, the clamps, I love these, 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 uh, flexible arms those and the clamps. Those elbows, yeah, yeah, they're fantastic. It's, um, it's incredible. Yeah. Actually, uh, a pro tip, um, if you use that clamp, um, and you stick it onto like a boom arm, like I have a boom arm that sits on my crafting desk for doing behind the scenes stuff. And the, the boom, the thread that's on the boom arm is a, uh, what is it? Uh, five eighths inches. I think the other side is the regular ball head screw size. Yeah. So I have an adapter that goes down to quarter 20 and I stick that elbow onto that. So if a boom arm right with the elbow on it, and then it gives me all the flexibility I need to move the my GoPro when I'm recording things. And if your camera is small, like if, like if it's not like a big like DSLR thing, but it's a smaller thing that you're recording with, um, you can actually just plug that into the platypod and then put your camera on the other end. And then you have a really flexible, low, um, low height ball head type thing that you can use if you really want to get down low. Yeah. Like if you're crazy and trying to shoot six inch action figures off the ground. Uh, and and of course, what you can do is, first of all, with these clamps, you know what's uh, what's amazing is you can uh, you can attach them um, directly to uh, one of the the goosenecks, or you can use one of these arms. Um, yep. And of course, you can you can hold all sorts of different things. So like if you want to flag off some light, for example, you can you can uh, attach a flag to it, or you can hold a you know a cardboard card if you're using something as a background, for example, or um, you know, or, or, a or a reflector or whatever it may be. Um, and you can you can really hold them in in place. Which is fantastic. The other thing I think that's really cool is, um, is on one hand, you, you know, they uh, they make this platy ball, which is a really innovative, um, you know, uh, tripod head, basically. Um, but it comes with this with this platy ball disc, essentially. Yep. Which, um, on one hand, allows you to very quickly and easily attach your camera to the actual tripod head. That's cool. But you can also use this to mount your camera directly onto the plat uh, onto the platy pod as well, and that gets yep. you super low. I mean, it could be any it any does. lower than that. Yeah, I, I've done. I use that all the time. Is use the uh, platy disc because when I first saw the platy disc, I was like, "What is this thing? It's a it's a round arco Swiss plate. How is that useful in any yep. way, shape, or form?" It turns out it holds your camera just as well as a square one, um, yep. but also it allows you to put it on the um, on the platy pod directly. Um, 
because it because at the bottom is a screw for the uh, ball head size thread. Uh, so you can just screw that in, screw your camera on top of it like you normally would, and it's just high enough to clear the uh, the legs. But then you can use the legs and adjust those. And I I did the math, and I think it's like a ten degree arc if you just move the legs up and down. So you still have some ability to kind of aim your camera a little bit. So oftentimes when I'm shooting a, a six inch action figure, I'll have my camera down low in a platy pod using the uh, plate, and then I'll just angle it up just slightly. So I'm kind of shooting roughly chest height if he was a human, um, but upwards. So um, a lot of times when you're shooting like superhero figures, you want to shoot them facing up because it gives them that power pose. Um, and that works out really well. Kevin, so you're also an instructor uh, for Kelby One and you've, you've put a number of classes together um, for for that learning platform. Um, tell us a little bit about what you're doing with that. Um, so Kelby One um, if is a photography education company that operates out of Tampa, um, well, just outside Tampa, Florida. Um, and they have instructors come in and record classes about whatever their expertise is. Uh, and they put them out on their platform uh, for their subscribers to watch and learn. And their quality of teaching there is exceptional. Um, so the way it kind of started was I bought this, it all comes back to toys. I bought this Lego Apollo 11 Rockfit model. And I was putting it together and I thought, what I really need to do is make a shot of this. And I knew that Eric Kuna, who is the vice president of Calby One, he's also a very, very good rocket photographer. Um, and I kind of knew him a little bit because uh, uh, we met at like Photoshop World and stuff. So um, I figured he would, you know, take my phone call, so to speak. So I, <laughs> I sent him an email saying, hey, by the way, could I borrow one of your photos to make this Lego shot? I was like, yeah, sure. Um, so he sent me a photo of a, or a SpaceX rocket taking off, actually from the same launch pad that the Apollo 11 launched from. So I, I photoshopped out his rocket and put in my rocket and created an image out of it, which is really cool. And that for let, him, for let me do that. And then he said, you ever thought about teaching a class? I thought, um, absolutely not, because I don't want to speak in public, and that sounds horrible and terrifying. But then after a while, I thought, Maybe, because there's not a lot of toy photography educational stuff out there. Um, I've, everything I've learned has been learning up from other people doing other things and then just trying to apply it, kind of like that, the lighting the car thing. Um, so I said, I'll give it a try. So I submitted a proposal for uh, a class on introduction to toy photography. And for some reason, they said, sure, it sounds great. Um, but right then is when they had lockdown. Uh, so I was like, well, that's annoying because they stopped obviously flying people in. Um, so I ended up recording it in this very room, uh, which was a nerve wracking experience because I went from how hard can it be to record something? It's just a camera and I know cameras to there is nothing familiar between shooting a still image and shooting video. It's a completely different skill set. What am I doing? Uh, but I managed to get something together and they edited it together um, and did their magic. Uh, so on Kelby One is a uh, introductory to toy photography course. And, um, then I also did another one on um, uh, ways to uh, spark your creativity and kind of practice being creative and uh, just uh, improve your skills, exercise to improve your skills and to kind of get out of your comfort zone and think of new things that you can do. Um, so I have two classes at Kelby One. Um, the second one, they actually... I, it was after lockdown and I got to actually go to the studios and actually do it, you know, professionally with, you know, actual filmographers who know what they're doing and stuff like that, which is a really fun experience. It's actually because of the first class that I started my YouTube channel, because I realized I was not very good at talking on camera. So I thought, well, I have this gear now because I had to buy some stuff for this. Why don't I just do something on YouTube to practice being better at speaking on camera? Um, and it's kind of done its own thing, but I think it's worked, uh, that I've got more practice at this being a person on camera. Um, and yeah, so yeah, that's, those are my two classes. Um, I hope to do more. I haven't actually proposed anything yet, but I have some ideas cooking in the back of my head that, uh, will hopefully become classes as well. 
But it's, it's really, um, it's really true what you're saying is, you know, when it comes to public speaking, for example, or, or even learning how to speak on camera, you know, practice is, is really key. And, uh, I sometimes just for a laugh and a giggle, I look back at, at episode number one of the camera shake podcast, which <laughs> still cracks me up. But, you know, at the time, of course, uh, we, I think we named it, um, done is better than perfect because that's what it was all about. At the time, uh, this, you know, I remember when we first came up with the idea uh, for a podcast, you know, we were talking about it and within, probably within about 30 minutes on the phone, uh, we came up with so many reasons as to why it's, it was going to be difficult to do or, you know, why it was a good idea or whatever. And, you know, you, you come across, you come up against one obstacle after the other. And the reality is, of course, it's really easy to talk yourself out of a really good idea. You know, yeah, and so what the conclusion that we came to in the end was that you know we said like, okay, well, okay, what are you doing on Monday, four o'clock? And my friend Nick was, well, uh, you know, nothing. I'm stuck in the house. You know, <laughs> we're all stuck in the house. So we went, okay, well, you know, Monday, four o'clock is where we're going to do it. You know, and we're going to have to figure it out between now and then. And you know, we just have to accept that the first episode is probably going to be pretty terrible. But you know, hopefully, if we keep doing it, then by episode ten, it's probably going to be better than. It was in episode one, and then if we make it to episode 20, then it's probably going to be a whole lot better. So, you know, so we just decided that actually we're just going to go for it. We're just going to get started and, you know, and and, and learn from from the experience. Um, yeah. and, and now, you know, now it's like, where are we now? 150, 151 episodes in, and, you know, a, a lot of things have improved. The whole process has improved um, in terms of speaking to camera. It's, you know, it it's been you know, a mind blowing experience for me, you know, because I didn't like talking to camera either. Um, and right, it's, right. It's, it's gotten a lot, it's gotten a lot better. And I've also, um, I've, uh, discovered teleprompters works really well. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah so, I have, I have one of those when I recorded my second class. Cause I've, one thing I realized is I write fairly well, but I don't write in the same way I speak. Right. So I was writing out these things I wanted to say but they didn't come out of my mouth correctly because yeah. it didn't match my pattern. Um, so that was, that was tricky, but yeah, it's, a, funny, it's a hard process. You, a funny thing about that. Um, I, I was invited to write a guest blog for Kelby, Kelby one, um, last year, I think it was. And so I, I wrote the thing and, and I literally wrote it the way that I usually talk. Right. And right. Uh, I thought it'd be a good idea. Cause I'm not, I'm not a native English speaker, you know, um, I grew up in Germany. And, uh, so I thought it'd be a good idea for me to get my wife to proofread the whole thing, you know, and so she could be my editor basically. Right. And, uh, the, the thing is she, my wife's a teacher, right? And she read through the whole thing. She goes like, this is terrible. It sounds exactly like you speaking. And, uh, and I said, yeah, but that's how I wanted to sound. That's exactly how I wanted to sound. And so she's like, she's extremely good. My wife is, is brilliant at writing letters of complaint, you know, <laughs> official letters. She's absolutely, she's so much better than I at, at, at that sort of thing. Um, but when it comes to writing, like in your own voice, it's really important to, you know, to pay attention to that, I think. And especially if you want to bring something across and you want to do it in your own unique personal style, it's really important that you can hear your voice when you're reading the, the written words, essentially, you know. Yeah. And uh, that's a really interesting experiment, uh, experience. And of course, ever since then, I've, I've written several blogs and I always get my wife to proofread it. And she's really gotten used to the way that I write. And so now she's kind of tuned into that, you know, and she makes suggestions that are more in line with how I would say it ordinarily. You know, it's, it's a really yeah. interesting learning experience for yeah, sure. It's one of those skills because I like, I used to keep a blog. Um, so I write about my experiences before I was uh, doing photography stuff. Um, I did a lot of hiking and ge uh, thing called geocaching. So I wrote my experience and I love oh, yeah. doing that. But when it came to like work and you're having to write like design documents and stuff, I absolutely hated it because the voice was different and it took me a long time to find a way to kind of be me in a way that's still business-like. Um, and similarly, when you're on video, it's find a way to say the things you want to say written down in a way that is you, um, but not quite you, because you're kind of, you almost put on a, 
I, when I'm when I'm doing my YouTube thing, I, I think of it as I put I'm putting on a character that's basically Dave, but more extrovert. Yes, absolutely. Um, that's basically yeah. that's basically what it is. Um, and learning how to do that is a massive undertaking, especially if you're me. Um, it's it's a it's just it's a totally different set of of skills um, and an experience that you don't really get anywhere else. Yeah, it's really um, it does require some to a degree. It does require some acting skills, I think, um, yeah. because because the camera, interestingly enough, almost like it sucks the energy out of you. Like when you're talking to camera in the way that you would normally talk, and you think like, oh yeah, you know, I'm quite upbeat and like you know, um, animated and whatever. You watch it back and you go like, oh whoa, that's like uh, that's so boring. And so uh, automatically you're gonna have to just ramp your own enthusiasm up, you know, to yeah, to yeah, the next exactly. level. So it's it's almost like you know you're you're creating this character that's sort of a hyper real version of yourself, you know. It's like when I when I do the um, you know the podcast intro, for example, I'm always like a lot more hyper than I'm than I would normally be. Yeah, you know? it's like a lot yeah. more animated because that's it's important because that's you know that thing sort of you know if you if you pair it up with the fact that the camera just sucks all the all the joy <laughs> out of you, when, you know, then you get it back to sort of a normal level and. Um, and you know it, it just takes a little while to get into that. So yeah, I completely get what you're saying. You can you just switch on that 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 character when yeah, the red I, light's on. I also noticed that when I was shooting some models, um, occasionally I'll get a chance to shoot you know actual humans. Um, uh, I call them voice activated uh, action figures. Um, but the first time I did it, um, it was in a shoot with like a whole bunch of people there. Um, but and it eventually became my turn to you know, point my camera and get the model to do something. And I had some ideas, but, and I was all excited for it. Then I, the second I kind of stood there, held my camera and staring in front of another person, I was like, I have no idea what to do now because I don't know how to talk to you. Cause it feels incredibly rude just to ask you to do something. Um, like, cause, but that I mean, that's the nature of the relationship. But if you're not used to that, it's, incredibly off-putting because i would never like walk up to somebody in the street and say hey would you mind just standing here and putting your hand in your hip and you kind of cock your head like this um you wouldn't ever do that um <laughs> yeah. but it, it's like the anxiety level was like basically you know high school dave talking to you know cheerleader throws up i don't know what to do right now maybe yeah. go away um but over time it became easier but yeah it's it's there's so much difference being in front of the camera being from being behind the camera oh absolutely yeah yeah. It's, uh, I always think of it as like I, I sort of press the acting button, you know. So I just yep. I just use all of my very limited acting skills to uh, you know to <laughs> to just switch on the hyperdrive, you know, and then, <laughs> and, then uh, and then hopefully you know it comes out all right. But um, you know, one of the I think one of the advantages in particular with with this podcast is is this very little scripted um, stuff, and this is it really is just simply a conversation, you know, yeah. um, and that's. And I, you know, I tend to just script the intros and the outros just simply because I'm not exactly uh, known as a one take wonder. Let's put it this way, <laughs> you know, it just makes right. the process easier when I'm when I'm editing it. Um, afterwards, it makes it, from my experience as a guest, it makes it easier too because it just let me talk about the things that I know about, and I don't have to try to conform to some sort of style. So exactly. it works out well. Yeah, exactly, and that's that's the whole point about you know this this particular uh, podcast. It really is all about. You know, just having a conversation, and that's right. you know, ultimately, I think that's 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 the important part, um, which you know, sets us apart from from other uh, podcasts, and and it's just it's just so much more fun. Um, I always, with every guest that we have on the show, I learn a ton of stuff, and um, ultimately, I think that makes me a better photographer. You know, so even that's if all. I if I talk to somebody um, who let maybe a landscape photographer or something, I don't really shoot landscapes. But there's always a lot that I can take away from that, and so hopefully the hope is, of course, that that's the same experience for our listeners. You know, um, that there's there's always a whole lot of stuff to to take to take home and to think about and mull it over and think like, well, that's a really good idea, and you know that will then inform a decision that you make in your own photography, you know, further down the road. And that's yeah, really that, I've learned so much. Like I said, there's not a lot of toy photography stuff out there. But I've learned from so many other people, like model photographers, how to pose things translates to how to pose action figures and make it look realistic. Um, the, uh, Tim Wallace and the cars for lighting, uh, landscape stuff for backgrounds, like all, and even not just photography stuff, but I've learned a lot of 
how to do modeling from watching like uh, Hollywood people talk about how they made Hollywood movies. Um, and like, it doesn't all quite apl uh, apply directly, but if you pull out those nuggets and then stick all those nuggets into one big basket, then your scope of knowledge and understanding of what you do becomes that much bigger and it expands your possibilities and it just makes the process much smoother. Yeah, and, and from a like from a creative point of view, you know, I always equate this to uh, to guitar playing. So in a, in a former life, I used to be a session musician. Um, and and so I always relate things to to music or to guitar playing uh, because it's an easy comparison in many ways. Right. And um, the the thing, the way I equate that usually is, you know, say like when you learn how to play the guitar and you learn how to play guitar solos, for example, you know, you spend a long time for the first number of years, you know, learning other people's solos. So you learn a Jimi Hendrix solo and then you learn... Um, you know, eventually you learn, I don't know, a Joe Satriani solo. And then, you you know, you learn Eddie Van Halen solo. And, right. uh, you know, and so on. And so, and then you learn Eric Clapton solo and whatever. And so you learn all these different solos by different guitarists. And, and further down the line, you'll develop your own personal style. And it's a little bit like, you know, you pour all of these ingredients into a bucket. And the end result is... Is like I said, it's your own personal style because everybody's different. We've all been pouring different ingredients into that bucket, and so the end result is always going to be different. So and that's that's you know that's what then makes somebody sound like themselves. So you know, whilst when I was a kid, I tried my hardest to sound like Eddie Van Halen, now I sound like me because you know I also love ZZ Top big time, yep. and you know, and and lots of other guitar players, and so over. 20, 30 years, I've been pouring all these different things into a bucket. And the end result now makes me different from the next guy because the next guy has been listening to, I don't know, Separate Tour and, you know, all sorts of all sorts of other bands. Um, and they've been taking their influences from other players. And so as a, as, as a consequence, they sound different. And that's that's what makes us all different. And photography or any creative arts in my mind is, is kind of the same thing. You know, you take your influences from here and there and everywhere. And then over time, what happens is you create your own personal style and your own creative persona that way. Yeah. It also, I think, makes it easier to get over the, I don't want to tell people what I do because I don't want to reveal the secrets. <laughs> yeah, that's um, usually there, 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 Yeah, that's some, yeah, some, um, which you can kind of understand in some ways, but when it comes to artistic things, it's exactly that. You may spit, take, and I do exactly these things. And if you try to do those exact things, you would not come up with the same result I did. You would come up with your own results. Um, and because you're not just taking from what I say, but all the other people that have been around you, and plus your own vision and insight and what you like to shoot and, you know, every like whole life experience. Um, so by sharing, which one thing I like about talking shop is um, it just puts, more influence into the world that people can draw from and then they'll create their own thing and then I get to look at more interesting things than just my own stuff because I know what my stuff looks like I made it um, I want to look at somebody else I don't want to look at somebody else's stuff that looks like mine I want to look like somebody else's stuff that looks like theirs yeah um, exactly and the, that's the beautiful thing you know about photography or, or the arts in general is you know he every once in a while you come across somebody who does a thing where you go wow what the I've never what is that you know, it's just like, uh, it's that moment of astonishment when you look at somebody's work. Like Tim, well, you mentioned Tim Wallace earlier. And you know, I I like photographing cars, but but Tim's work is a whole different ball game. It's just incredible, you know? You, yeah, you look is. at that and you just go, whoa, what, you know? And it then it then inspires you, you know, to try and, um, you know, and learn to, to get better. It just pushes you along, you know, rather than, because it's really easy to, um, to sit back and go like, ah, oh, yeah, I know how to, I know how to shoot portraits. And you come across the next guy and you go, whoa, hang on a second. <laughs> but I didn't that's think a... of doing that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, you know, you build that into your own photography and that's, you know, that's, that's how it's such a, you know, such a great, um, satisfying thing to, to, you know, improve yourself and your own craft. Yeah. That's kind of what it's all about. I mean, I do this to please me. I want to put my vision out into the world. Um, so, yeah, yeah. that's, that's what I want. Um, you know, 
and sometimes it's just a, it's just a good idea, you know, because it's something that pushes your own, um, you know, your own ability is to just simply to take something and go like, oh yeah, I'm going to give this. Show. I'm going to try that. Like like for instance, I was I was saying earlier, you know, I've got an idea um, uh, to do a little project which uh, which actually incorporates my daughter or daughters potentially. And it'll be just a fun thing for us to do together. You know, we can just um, go out. Sure. There's a place not too far from where I live called the Moors. Um, and it's like a wild area, you know, uh, which is literally, okay. I think is a bit, it's probably a bit more like, I guess. But it's just a cool, cool looking uh, sort of area uh, that will lend itself, I think, very well to to shooting, you know, action figures and stuff like that. So, um, so that's something I want to try and do and get out maybe over Easter, you know. Just... When it comes to action figures, just be careful of scale. Right. Um, one of the thing, one of the tricky things about shoot, two, there's two things about shooting um, in the real world with action figures. One is that things don't scale up right. Like right. A, a small fleck of sand could look like a you know a big pebble, um, that type of thing. Um, dirt looks much bigger than it is. Uh, the other thing is um, depth of field. It's very hard to shoot an action figure big size and get the background in focus because you're just so close to the figure. Um, so just keep those in mind when you're thinking of things that those are the types of things you're going to have to overcome. Yeah. Um, but it could be it could be done. Um, uh, but it's those are the things that always surprise me. That and dust. Uh, dust yeah. is a major pain in the neck. Um, bring a uh, soft brush like a um, like a makeup brush that. They use right. for putting uh, powders on people's faces. Bring out one of those, and you can just brush off the dust off the figure because a little bit of speck of dust on a action figure is, you know, really big um, comparatively to a little speck of dust on a human. Uh, yeah. So those are the those are the things you need to. Uh, those are the getches I think that would yeah. make your what, life more difficult. What sort of focal length do you use to uh, to shoot? It varies. Uh, Usually in the studio, I have a uh, 35 millimeter macro, and I have a 50 millimeter macro that I tend to stick with. Um, when I'm out in the field, um, either I'm gonna shoot like really long and then get in close, like maybe like 200 millimeters, or if I want a lot, a lot of background, um, I have a 14 millimeter lens that I'll use that allows me to kind of do that. Uh, because it allows me to get up real close to the figure, so the figure's nice and big, but it still captures a lot of the, the background. So, uh, yeah, th that's kind of my range. Um, usually usually um, wider than narrower. Dave, it's been an absolute education um, having you on the show. It's been super fun. Thank you so much for uh, agreeing to come on the show and talk to us today. It was uh, mind-blowing. Yeah, more than welcome. It was a great conversation. I'm glad to be here. Thank you so much for listening to this episode or watching this video if you're over on YouTube. If you enjoyed it, please hit that like button and subscribe to our channel for more great content. But before you go, let me share a quick insight from behavior science. When you engage with content you enjoy, you not only make the creator's day, but you also trigger a positive emotion in yourself. It's a small action that can make a big difference in how you feel. So by liking, commenting, or sharing this video, you're not only supporting us, but you're also benefiting yourself. It's a win-win situation. If you enjoyed this episode, let me recommend another episode that I think you'll love. Check out episode 149 with Gilmer Smith. Actually, it's Hilmer Smith. I always get that wrong. Hilmer Smith, episode 149, for some incredibly creative photography. I promise you, it will blow your mind. And if you have any suggestions or feedback, we'd love to hear it. Your comments are incredibly valuable to us, of course, and uh, they help us improve our content. So please don't hesitate to share your thoughts. Remember to hit the like button, ring the bell, and share with your friends. You can help us reach a greater audience all over the world. Once again, thank you for watching and listening, and we'll see you next Thursday.